to the Gospel of John, the fourth chapter. John chapter number four. And we're going to be reading about a lady that all of you have heard about from your earliest days, probably in Sunday school, the woman at the well that we commonly call her. In most of our study Bibles and Sunday school lessons, a lot of times we just simply call her the woman at the well. John chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 1 through 13, and then we'll back up and see what the Lord would have for us today. Verse 1, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria, and then he cometh to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. And there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. And the woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Are thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drink of this water shall thirst again. Now here in chapter 4, we see our Lord dealing with a woman who was an unbeliever. And that's something our Lord did quite often. You'll recall John chapter 3, that he had a very lengthy conversation with a man. A man by the name of Nicodemus, and this man was uh, very moral. He was very religious. He was a man of very good reputation. Matter of fact, the Bible says that he was a ruler of the Jews. And the Lord shared with him the gospel message. And that same message was what he delivered to this woman who was in a lot of ways the opposite of Nicodemus. This woman was an immoral woman. This was a woman who had a poor reputation. Uh, this was a woman as opposed to a man. She was at the lower end of society as opposed to being a ruler, but our Lord gave to her the same message that He gave to Nicodemus. He gave to her the gospel. Perhaps the conversations were a little different. Nicodemus sought out Christ. Christ seeks out the woman at the well. Nicodemus came inquiring. The woman came in a state of indifference. It really wasn't something that was on her mind, so they were different as you and I are all different, as the people that you and I work with and our students go to school with, we're all different in one way or another, but we all need the same Jesus. We all need the same Lord, the same gospel. If you'll notice with me here in verse 1 of chapter 4, it says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and he departed into Galilee. Now if you know a little bit about your geography in, of Israel, of ancient Israel, Judea was the southern portion of Israel. 
And then towards the middle, you had uh, Samaria. And then the northern part of Israel would have been Galilee. Our Lord was in Judea. But verse 4 is a verse that gets my attention. Because the Pharisees were trying to cause division between the disciples of John and the disciples of Christ, Christ said, I'll head north to Galilee. I'll leave the area. Now, historically, Jews and Samaritans did not get along. Samaritans were a people who had intermarried, Jewish people who had intermarried with Gentiles. And the Jews looked down upon their noses and said, you know, you're unclean. Uh, we'll have no dealings with you. We will not worship with you. We will not even drink out of the same cup. We will not even say, use the same eating utensil as you. So there was a lot of animosity between these two people groups. And when a devout Jew decided to travel, they would take the long way around to avoid Samaria. Now, that's not where you would get in your automobile and drive 10 miles out of the way. We're talking about people primarily walking. And we're talking about people who went to a great deal of effort to avoid people simply because of the animosity and the hatred that they had for them. But I love verse 4. Look at verse 4. Speaking of our Lord, it says that He must needs go through Samaria. No one else felt that. Others would go along the coast. Others would cross the, cross the Jordan River and go up and make their way into Galilee. But speaking of Christ, He absolutely, positively must go through Samaria. It wasn't because he was tired from the walk. He would eventually get tired of the walk. It wasn't because that uh, he was trying to uh, keep an appointment other than this divine appointment that the Father had willed for him. The Lord did what he did because it was a divine appointment. He wanted this woman to come to a saving faith. He wanted this woman to hear the gospel. What an awesome God you and I serve. Our Lord is concerned about the masses. Jesus fed the thousands. But He also had conversations with the individual. And I know a lot of times when we get in big crowds, we can maybe feel a little better. Uh, maybe we're not feeling quite as lonely in a big crowd, even though you can be lonely in a big crowd. Maybe we don't feel as guilty in a big crowd. Maybe we can focus the blame on someone else, or maybe we can share in the blame. But eventually, you're going to be by yourself. You're going to be alone with your thoughts. You're going to be alone with your pains and the aches of the heart. And our Lord is concerned for the individual just as much as He is concerned for the masses. He's concerned for the individual as much as He is concerned for the nations. So in verse 4, we see our Lord walking through a place where all devout Jews would have criticized Him for walking because He had a divine appointment to meet with an individual at a well. And what's ironic is He showed up and this woman showed up at about noon. Now, I pointed it out this morning in the Sunday school class, depending on what Bible translation you're holding, it may say 6 p.m. in your translation. But most commonly, it's explained and written out that she showed up at noon. You say, what's the big deal about the noontime meeting at a well? Well, typically, women would go carry the water in their very large containers, big enough that they could carry on their shoulder and so forth, and they would do this early in the morning, before the sun began to beat down, before it got very, very hot. But this woman purposely shows up at noon. Why is she doing it? She is wanting to avoid the other women. 
because the other women are wanting to avoid her. And you're going to find out why in just a moment. But basically she was an outcast in the very city in which she lived. But even though women wanted to avoid her and probably men of reputation wanted to avoid her, Christ did not. He knew that she needed what all men, women, women, boys and girls need, and that is salvation. That is a Lord and Savior. So Christ must needs go through Samaria. Verse 5. And then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. Notice in verse 6, it says that Jesus, therefore being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. It was about noontime. But before we get into that noontime, I want you to notice that the Bible says that Jesus was tired. He was bone tired. I bet some of you have been there. You've been just tired. You say, what's the significance of that? For you, it might have been you were out there doing yard work in the heat for too long. Or maybe you'd had a very trying day at work and you were just bone tired, dog tired. But Jesus is God. He's the Son of God, yes, but He is God in the flesh. The Lord Jesus left heaven and took on Himself the form of a man that He might identify Himself with us. The Lord Jesus Christ is 100% God, but He's also 100% man. He can relate to what you and I go through because He was fully human, as He is fully God. The Lord Jesus was tempted. Have any of you ever been tempted? Temptation's not a sin. Giving in to temptation is a sin. Our Lord was tempted yet without sin, meaning that He had never done anything wrong, He had never done anything displeasing to God because He could not, because He was 100% God. But because He was 100% man, He can relate to what you and I go through. The Bible tells us that Satan cast, hurled every dart that he could think of. He hurled every dart at his disposal. He emptied the toolbox when he come after our Lord and Savior. The Bible tells us that when he was tempted of the devil after 40 days of fasting and Satan come at him with every kind of uh, twist, every kind of deceit. And over and over again, Satan was defeated in that Christ would counter that temptation with Scripture. And I'm so thankful that our Lord did that because uh, I can't call for angels. I don't have angels in my cell phone where I can speed dial them. Angels are, are not at my beck and call. And uh, I can't leave them a voicemail or shoot them a text and say, hey, I need about 500 of you right now. But I can memorize Scripture. I can practice Scripture. And when Satan came at Christ, Christ would say over and over again, it is written. It is written written and there have been times in my life when I have been tempted and Bible verses have come to my attention to my memory and there have been times in my life where temptation has come and I just said I'm going ahead anyway and regretted it and committed sin I always enjoyed the outcomes of the time when I remembered scripture and practiced scripture but our Lord here, it, He was tired. And again, that gives me some comfort that our Lord, go, He's gone through what you and I go through. He can relate. He's a high priest who can empathize, who can sympathize with us. So there He is sitting at the well at about the noon hour in verse 7. Coincidence? Uh, there's no coincidences with God. This was a divine appointment at verse 7. And there comes a woman of Samaria to draw water. She was not supposed to be there under usual circumstances. 
But she was there and the Lord knew before she would be there that she would be there. You say, wow, that's impressive. How about this? She would later say, this man told me everything I've ever done. Now that was a little bit of an exaggeration, but he told her enough about her that she knew was impossible for a stranger to know and it got her attention. So if he knows her past better than she knows her present, I think it was a very easy feat for Christ to sit at that well saying, she'll be here real soon. So there comes a woman to Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. Now Nicodemus sought out Christ. Nicodemus came with questions. This woman just wants water. She is really not interested in this man at the well. Matter of fact, she's surprised that he even speaks to her. Because in that day, in that culture... It was not customary for men to speak to women who were not their relatives. Especially if you were a teacher or a rabbi. This was just out of the ordinary. It went against the, uh, the social norms. So this woman shows up and really she's indifferent to who Christ is. Can any of you relate to that? Being indifferent to who Christ is? I hope you're not there now. If you are, I hope it changes before you leave. But probably many of us can say that at one point in time, I was indifferent to Christ. I can say that. I can remember being in school and having a few buddies invite me to church, a few. And I declined every time. Indifferent. I could care less what was going on at that church, their church, or why they wanted me to come. I was just indifferent. I had other things to do, like sleep late, go fishing, watch ball games, or hang out with friends or cousins or whatnot. But I was totally indifferent to the Lord. This woman shows up to the well, indifferent to this man who tries, who doesn't try, but who strikes up a conversation with her, and Jesus simply says, give me to drink. Verse 8. Why didn't his disciples give him a drink? Well, they were not there. They had gone into town to buy food. How many disciples does it take to buy food? Did they all have to go? I know when my children were younger, if, if mom went to town, they all of a sudden, all of them had to go as well. Like she needed help buying groceries. But they all would take off and load up and go to town. The disciples went into town to buy food. Did it need all of them? Surely not. Surely not. Surely two or three would have been sufficient to have brought all the food back to feed the disciples. But I believe that was a part of the divine providence of God. That the Lord Jesus did not need them to be hindrances to the conversation. So all of them were gone, and it was going to be a one-on-one -on -one conversation at the well, out in public view. In verse 9, it says, And then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that you being a Jew ask a drink of me, which am a woman? So she draws attention to those social mores. You're a man, and I'm a woman. You shouldn't be speaking to me. You're a Jew, and I am not. You definitely should not be speaking to me. You're a Jew. Now what I want you to notice in this passage, as the conversation goes along, her eyes begin to open to who Jesus is. At the start she says, you're a Jew. And as the conversation gets a little deeper, she realizes this is not just an ordinary Jew. She guesses and says, could you be greater than Jacob, our father? Are you one greater than Jacob? And the conversation continues and she says, Are you a prophet? Could you be a prophet? And then finally, near the end of the conversation, she says, You're the Christ. 
you're the Messiah. And our Lord was very, very patient with her as He led her through the conversation and led her to the realization as to who He is. Some of you can relate to that. Some of you can think back and how maybe one day Jesus was somebody that was in a book. That Jesus was somebody who died on a cross for reasons unbeknownst to you. That he was a man who was mistreated for some reason and didn't lash back. And then one day you come to realization that uh, uh, at church they call him the Son of God and they call him the Savior of the world. But for many of you, thank God, there come a day when you realize that He was your Lord and your Savior and that He was the door to heaven and that was the only way that you could ever be able to see God and be in heaven with God was through Christ. Praise the Lord for that realization. Praise the Lord for that coming of faith. And the Lord did this with this conversation with her. So she says in verse 9, You're a Jew and I'm a woman. You're talking to me? And you're asking me of a drink, verse 10. Powerful verse. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. This woman was ignorant of three things. And ignorance is not a bad word. It just means the absence of knowledge... I'm ignorant of many things. Paul would write to churches and say, Brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. And then he would tell them what he was hoping that they would gain knowledge in. But this lady here was ignorant of who Jesus was. She saw him as a Jew. Perhaps a teaching Jew. But she saw him as a Jew. She did not realize at this point that He was the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the very Son of God. And since she was ignorant of who He was, she was definitely ignorant of what He had to offer. They're having a conversation about water. He is talking about living water. And she is talking about physical water, and it goes over her head. So often when Christ would speak with people, they would think about the temporary, the temporal, the earthly, and he was emphasizing the spiritual. That's what happened with Nicodemus. Christ said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus said, how can an old man enter into his mother's womb a second time? I don't understand this. How is this possible? He says, give me a drink. And she says, why are you even asking me of a drink? And he said, if you knew who I was, and if you knew what I had to give, you would be asking for living water. So not only was she ignorant of who he was and what he had to offer, she was ignorant on how she could receive it. She looked at the Lord Jesus up and down and said, you don't even have anything to draw with. You're offering me water, but you don't have a bucket. You don't have a vessel. This is a deep well. How are you going to give me water of any type? So her background knowledge was very much lacking. I can relate to that. Some of you can remember growing up in a church from a little one. And you can remember Bible stories from Sunday school and maybe you sung in the Sunbeam Choir and you were in the Christmas plays and all of those things. I wasn't. I don't have those memories because that did not happen. That was not something that I ever experienced because I grew up in a non-church going home. And uh, so when I stepped foot into the church and began to hear the gospel, it took a while because all the pieces was not making any sense. And I've shared with you when the pastor said, it's important that you get saved. I didn't say it out loud, but in my mind I said, I remember this. Saved from what? From what? Now, if I was outside and I saw a pit bull running at me 20 miles an hour, I would know being saved from a pit bull what that meant. 
If the house was on fire, I could understand what being saved from a house fire meant, but I was sitting in a comfortable pew, an air-conditioned church, and the pastor was talking about, we all need to be saved. So I had zero background and did not understand for some time until I was under the gospel for a period of weeks and the Holy Spirit put it all together for me and gave me understanding of my lost condition. Verse 11, the woman said unto him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. This well is deep. From whence then hast thou the living water? Are thou greater than our father Jacob? which gave us this well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle. And then Jesus made a very profound statement to her in verse 13. He said, Whosoever drinks of this water, Jacob's well, shall thirst again. Folks, verse 13 really is a statement about everything that's in this life and in this world. There is nothing you and I can gain in this life that will ever bring lasting satisfaction. It never will. You buy an automobile and within six months you, you wish you had bought another one. Or a different color. Or a different interior. You go to the restaurant and say, oh, I wish we had gone to the other one. My wife's favorite restaurant is it, it doesn't matter. And... Uh, I can never find that one, but that's the one she always wants to go to. But when I choose them, no longer, no sooner than we've had the food delivered, we've realized that we wish we had gone somewhere else, maybe to that it doesn't matter place. We have bought clothing and we get it home and think, ah, oh, yard sell it, goodwill it, give it away, take it back. And on and on it goes. And it goes that way throughout life. No matter what it is that the world has to offer, it will never satisfy. And Jesus tells this woman, listen, I'm sitting here at this well and you have come to draw water. And you can draw it and you will be thirsty again. But he said, I can give you living water that will satisfy the very depths of the soul. Now what is this living water? Well, we find it in John 7, where the Lord speaks of living water again. So he does this two times. In John 7, roughly verses 37 to 40, long about in there, the Lord reveals very clearly that the living water is about salvation. It is about the Holy Ghost of God. It is about being born again. And when you're born again, you receive the indwelling presence and power of the Holy Spirit of God. And God satisfies. God brings peace and joy. God gives a peace that passes all understanding for those who are in fellowship and in close, close relationship with God. I hope you've known people that have modeled that before you. I hope you're one of those that have modeled that because it's a real possession. In our Sunday school lesson, I believe last week, the Apostle Paul was stoned to the point that those that were doing him the harm thought they had killed him. Do you remember that passage? And they picked up his body and threw it out the, the, the city limits. And the disciples gathered around him and perhaps had a prayer meeting, perhaps were grieving, but as they were looking down, Paul regained consciousness. He had been knocked out. He had been knocked unconscious. And Paul got up. And you know what he did? He went back into the town. <laughs> he went back into the town. He would eventually move on, but he went back into the town. A lot of people would have quit. A lot of times you and I tell a lot about our maturity, about what it takes to get us to quit. Throw in the towel. Give up. That says a lot about us. But Paul, he never quit. I think of uh, some dear friends that are now in heaven that were very close to Ruth and I a long time ago. I think they've been with the Lord now since the 1990s, I believe. No, no, no. Early 2000s. 
But we had been very close to this couple, and uh, they were like grandparents to us, and uh, very close. My buddy and I, we would do jail ministry together, and he would play the guitar, and I would preach, and then we would go around cell to cell in jails and in prisons, and just a good man. Very bad health. Oh, he had terrible health. Had a bad heart, congestive heart failure. Suffered multiple heart attacks. And I remember one day, uh, he was in the hospital after having suffered a heart problem of some sort, heart attack, I can't remember what it was, but a heart flare-up. He got dismissed that morning, and I said, well, don't worry about the jail service tonight. You know, I'll get by. He said, oh, I'm coming. He had nitroglycerin in, under his, in his mouth. and said, let's go. <laughs> and went down there and played the guitar, and the man had uh, just all... But anyway, his health deteriorated so much that he was a career military man. I believe, I believe uh, it was Navy. Career Navy man. And uh, he decided to move to Pensacola to be close to a military hospital. He said, my health is just so bad... I, I'm, I'm having to see somebody weekly. I might as well get close and reap the benefits of a, of a career. So they had a single-wide mobile home that they were going to move to Florida. And while they were in the process of moving to Florida, prior to that happening, his wife found out she had cancer in her eye, and they had to remove her eye. Prior to her getting cancer and removing her eye, they had a son in his 30s who developed brain cancer, and died very quickly. So they had lost a son. His wife had lost an eye. He was just a heartbeat away from death. And then as they're taking their home down US 82, the axle breaks right in the middle of a four-lane highway. Ruined. Lost their home. That was their home. And I never saw them quit. They never quit. They didn't quit church. They didn't mumble and grumble. They lost a son. She lost an eye. They lost their home. They didn't quit. They had an amazing love for the Lord. They had an amazing, mature relationship with Christ. And they were an amazing blessing to Ruth and I when we were in our 20s and were very close to them right on up until as we grew in the Lord with them. Uh, and the Lord called them both home to, home to be with Him. They had the satisfaction of knowing the Lord Jesus personally and as their Lord and Savior. Jesus said to the lady, You drink the water you have, you'll thirst again. I can give you living water that will satisfy so that you will never thirst again. Verse 14, whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water I give shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. She's still focusing on the physical. And he says to her, go and call your husband. And you two come back hither. And she says in verse 17, I have no husband. And Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In this you have said truly. Now, we don't know anything about these marriages. The only thing I do know about these marriages is that she was the common denominator. The first one could have been no good. The second one could have been no good. The third one could have been no But after a while, maybe she needed to look in the mirror. After five marriages, and now she was in a physical, intimate relationship and was not married and when Christ revealed this to her she said sir you're a prophet you know my history and I have never seen you before so this was a woman who had some moral issues 
She was a woman who was ignorant of who he was. At times had been very indifferent to the things of God. But as this conversation went on, she says in verse number 29 to the people of her village, Come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? She was convinced and said, you're going to have to talk me out of this belief. You need to come see this one who is the Christ. I close with this. The Lord knows everything you and I have done. I don't know about you, but I have some shame in my past. The Lord knows everything you've done, everything I've done. But He wants to forgive you. He wants to save you. This woman who probably exceeded most of us in lifestyle and in bad decision making to the point that the whole town was against her and that's why she drew water by herself because nobody wanted to be around her. She was an outcast in every way. The Lord loved her. The Lord loved her. He loves you. He loves me. Have you given your life to Christ? Do you know that you know that if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven? Do you know the Lord that way? If you don't, I'd like for you to walk an aisle and say, Jay, pray with me. We had a young man do that last week after service was over. Sawyer gave his life to the Lord last Sunday after everybody had left, just four or five of us hanging around. And he wanted to talk about getting saved. He gave his life to Christ. Now that was a young man who knew what he needed to do. Everybody in here this morning is not young. Have you done what you've needed to do? Let's truly, let's come. Let's pray. As she's making her way up. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, for this lady who met Jesus. She could not sin enough. She could not be miserable enough to not be loved by God. Father, I'm so thankful for that because there have been times I have sinned and I have been miserable. And you loved me, you loved her, and Father, you love all of these. You tell us in your word that you love the world so much that Christ died on the cross that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Father, thank you for the gift of Christ. Thank you for the salvation that comes through faith in him. Lord, draw men, women, boys, and girls to you. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.